movies together. But one night my parents brought home this movie from the video store. And what was odd is before they watched it, my mother had ordered my brother and sister and I to leave the room. While my siblings each went to our separate rooms, I stayed downstairs and hid quietly in the kitchen and caught just a few glimpses of this strange movie called Blue Velvet. Now I think this was the first time that I had ever become aware that there were movies for families and movies for adults. Now as a grown man, Blue Velvet is a film I have referenced several times when teaching students about movies. It's an eerie and engaging piece of filmmaking that I think reveals many unspoken truths about both film watching and the contradictions of American life. So what I would like to do is take a few scenes from this movie and examine how the film was working as a whole. So, give me just a few minutes of your time and let's go back and take a look at Blue Velvet. Blue Velvet begins with one hell of an opening sequence. The scene is accompanied by Roy Oberson's now famous song, aptly titled Blue Velvet. Here we see a seemingly typical American town, filled with white picket fences and red flowers. But they're not just red flowers, they are the perfect shade of red. We see perfectly manicured lawns that look like something out of a Norman Rockwell painting or a bad rerun of Leave it to Beaver. Now, right from the get-go, we get a sense that there's something not quite right about this town. After all, no town could be this perfect. No place could be this picturesque. Now, we also see a man watering his lawn, but then he suffers some kind of attack and drops onto the ground into an awkward position where he's gripping his hose and the water is shooting out from his crotch area in an almost orgasmic fashion. This is an example of the dark sense of humor that's found all throughout Blue Velvet. But as the scene continues, the camera slowly peers under the perfectly manicured lawns that we see. And here we find a nest of black insects that are just eating, biting, and tearing at each other. In fact, the theme of insects and bugs is a theme that will appear several times throughout this movie. But it's here where the film sets up its central conflict, the dichotomy between what is on the surface and what lies underneath. This movie is about peering into places, about uncovering hidden things. Hidden things within places, and hidden things within people. More broadly, Blue Velvet is about the age-old conflict between light and dark, good and evil man and nature, all played out on the surface of this picturesque small town. It's no accident that the town is named Lumberton and is built on the very idea of repressing nature or cutting down trees and trying in vain to control what is natural. Now the plot of Blue Velvet revolves around a young man named Jeffrey Beaumont. Jeffrey is attempting to uncover the mystery surrounding this severed ear that he finds. This mystery will eventually lead Jeffrey to the apartment of a nightclub singer named Dorothy. Now Jeffrey enters Dorothy's apartment by impersonating an exterminator. The insect theme appears again. But when Jeffrey becomes trapped in Dorothy's apartment, we get to see one of the film's most famous sequences. As Jeffrey hides in Dorothy's closet, he moves from would-be detective to reluctant voyeur. When Dorothy eventually discovers Jeffrey is spying on her, voyeurism quickly morphs into sadism, as the once objectified Dorothy turns Jeffrey into the object of her sexual fantasies. I want to see you get undressed!
As the scene continues, we get our first glimpse of the character Frank Booth, played memorably by Dennis Hopper. With the Frank character, we get a film villain like no other. Booth seems driven entirely by the desire to satisfy his own appetites for violence, sex, and drugs. He is an example of an unyielding patriarchal id who is about to unleash his passions on the helpless Dorothy. Jeffrey then witnesses this horrific yet captivating display of sadomasochistic sex as Frank abuses and berates Dorothy, even huffing laughing gas out of this plastic mask to heighten his sexual excitement. Now, what's interesting about this scene is Jeffrey, Jeffrey's fascination with what he sees. He seems to be repulsed, but at the same time, he can't look away. And our vision, the audience's vision, is linked to that of Jeffrey. Through Jeffrey, we have become peeping toms. This is important because, in a way, film watching makes voyeurs out of us all. When we watch a film, we sit in the darkness and peer into the lives of strangers. Like any peeping Tom, we can watch them, but they can't watch us. So in linking our vision to the voyeur, Jeffrey, and forcing him to watch these beautiful yet repulsive events, like Alfred Hitchcock's thriller Weird Window, Blue Velvet exposes and eventually challenges the secret pleasure of watching movies which is the pleasure of voyeurism. As I said before, Blue Velvet is about the battle between light and dark. The two sides of Jeffrey, his light side and his dark side, are embodied in his relationship with the film's two female characters. On the one hand, we have Sandy, played by Laura Dern. Sandy is innocent, naive, and frequently linked to the color white. Looking at her, she seems to have walked out of a 1950s TV show. But David Lynch isn't making fun of her. He finds real beauty and sincerity in the relationship between these two young lovers. All Sandy and Jeffrey wanted was a little excitement, but instead find themselves in a strange, nightmarish world they don't really understand. In contrast, Jeffrey's relationship with Dorothy is far from innocent. Dorothy is linked with darkness and dark colors, and his relationship with her is brutal, violent, and sexual. With Dorothy, we glimpse Jeffrey's dark side as he is seduced by the sexual power he has over this woman. It's as if this primal relationship has unleashed Jeffrey's darkness and transformed him into a duplicate of Frank. In one of the film's many famous scenes, Frank discovers Jeffrey's relationship with Dorothy. But rather than erupting in anger, Frank recognizes Jeffrey as a kind of kindred spirit and invites the boy into his world of underground sex and drugs. Here, Jeffrey and Dorothy are taken to a brothel. But here is also where we meet Ben, played by actor Dean Stockwell. Now, Ben is the only character in the whole film whom Frank admires and treats with respect. Perhaps it's because Ben is the only character who isn't repressing his sexuality. Unlike Frank and Jeffrey, Ben is a flamboyant, free, queen bee of this insect-like brothel. The sequence concludes with Ben regaling us with a strange lip-syncing of the song by Roy Overson, In Dreams. Now, the song In Dreams is about the fantasies we experience when dreaming. The idea of waking and dreaming runs throughout the film, and it's almost as if the underground world of insects, brutality, and sex are all just a bad dream in Jeffrey's head. The ending to Blue Velvet is one of my favorites in all of film. Jeffrey awakens almost as if he's waking from a dream, and the town of Lumberton has returned to innocence and, more, and normality. It's released from the destructive power represented by Frank. The sun is shining, the birds are singing, and the scene is accompanied by the music of Julie Cruz, who appears in many of David Lynch's other films. I love the audacity of ending a film this way. The movie gives us this repulsive, brutal imagery for almost two hours, then just wipes it all away. All the horrors we experienced are vanished. 
all under the guise of dreaming. This is the moral hypocrisy that Blue Velvet uncovers, which is that many Hollywood films aim not only to entertain us, but to cleanse us of our voyeuristic tendencies and our unspoken desire to see violence, sex, and carnage. Put simply, movies let us watch our own fantasies, our own dreams from a safe distance, and then leave them on the screen.